Let's begin by taking a look at what happened. President Kennedy was riding in a motorcade in downtown Dallas, Texas. The motorcade had just gone through the main part of downtown Dallas, had turned from Main Street, made a right-hand turn onto Houston Street, traveled one block, and then turned left, made a sharp left-hand turn onto Elm Street. Here's a photograph of the view from the sixth floor window of the Book Depository building that an assassin would have had of Elm Street. Here is a photograph taken through the telescopic sight of Oswald's <coughs> rifle from the sixth floor window. There's an FBI reenactment vehicle that's concealed by the leaves of a live oak tree from the sixth floor an assassin who wanted to fire a shot would have had to wait until the vehicle had moved from behind the leaves of the live oak tree because nobody would seriously shoot at this particular point because you simply can't see. There are two FBI agents sitting in this vehicle simulating Kennedy's and Connolly's positions. Here we have an interesting couple of slides, both of them taken directly from the Warren Commission's own evidence. The upper photograph shows the, a view from the sixth floor window of the FBI reenactment vehicle, the white convertible. When it was on Houston Street heading towards the Book Depository building, the bottom photograph taken through the telescopic sight of Lee Harvey Oswald's rifle shows the kind of shot that Oswald would have had had he fired when the limousine was in this position. And you can see clearly for yourself that a lone assassin, nobody else involved, no other gunman, would obviously have fired now because there's a point-blank shot right between the eyes of Kennedy. Why would a lone assassin wait for this limousine to turn the corner, to make a sharp left-hand turn, then drive past the live oak tree that we just saw, when he would have a perfect shot right here, right between the eyes. This question's never been answered. The first of several slides from the Zapruder film of the assassination. A man named Abraham Zapruder was standing between the book depository and the grassy knoll to the right front of where the limousine was, and filmed the motorcade, focusing, of course, on the Kennedy limousine. Here, Kennedy is simply smiling and waving to the crowd. Nothing has happened yet. The limousine proceeds forward until it disappears behind a street sign and then reappears behind the street sign for one second in actual time. Now we can see President Kennedy appear. Sometime during that one second that the limousine was behind the street sign, Kennedy was hit by the first shot. Kennedy's hands are moving up towards his face. He begins wincing in pain. Jacqueline Kennedy, seated to Kennedy's left, starts to look over towards him because she has heard the shot. Here, Kennedy has obviously been hit. He's hunched forward, his hands are going up towards his face. Governor Conley, seated directly in front of President Kennedy, however, appears not to have been struck at all. Kennedy shows no evidence of pain. The, he is holding his 10-gallon Texas Stetson hat in his hand. And yet, a fundamental part of the Warren Commission's thesis is that at this stage of the motorcade, Conley has been hit by the same bullet that's gone through Kennedy. According to the Warren Commission, Oswald fired a shot, that bullet went through Kennedy's neck, exited from his throat, then that same bullet went on to strike Conley in the back, go through his chest, exit from the chest, go all the way through his right wrist, shattering the radius, the wrist bone, and then lodging in his left thigh. 
Conley shows no evidence of reaction to any of this at this point. And it's not simply what you and I are seeing with our eyes, but Dr. Robert Shaw, the thoracic surgeon who operated on Governor Conley, also said that it's impossible for Conley to have been struck here. Dr. Shaw, by the way, was the head of the thoracic surgery unit for the U.S. Army in France during World War II. He had a great deal of experience in treating gunshot wounds of the chest area. Governor Conley was indeed interviewed by the Warren Commission. Governor Conley insisted that he was struck by a separate shot than the one that struck President Kennedy. Conley said, and what he says is verified by the Zapruder film, that he heard the first shot fired. And he started to turn around to look at Kennedy seated directly behind him. And he didn't see anything, and so he was gonna turn the other way to see Kennedy. But when he started to turn back, that's when the second shot hit him. He was absolutely positive that the second shot struck him, and only him, and the first shot struck Kennedy. And Conley had experience as a hunter. He knew the sounds of gunfire. He said he never heard the second shot because, of course, bullets move faster than the speed of sound. And so the impact of the shot on him. So Conley's testimony is strong evidence in and of itself against the single bullet theory. And yet, without the single bullet theory of the Warren Commission, the whole lone assassin theory collapses like a house of cards because Oswald or anybody else could not possibly have gotten off two separate shots, struck Kennedy, then struck Conley in the time limitations of the Zapruder film because we're only talking about a second and a half in time and you can't fire two shots from Oswald's rifle even without aiming in less than two and a quarter seconds. Now we move ahead. Governor Conley now begins to exhibit a reaction to being struck. Notice Conley's right shoulder, his hair, and his cheek. One eighteenth of a second later, Conley's right shoulder has slumped sharply downward. His cheeks fill up with air caused by the passage of the bullet through the right lung collapsing the lung and forcing air up into his mouth and his hair flies up on his head. Here is the bullet that the Warren Commission claims caused the damage in Kennedy and Conley. The Warren Commission claims that this single bullet went through Kennedy, struck Conley, shattering his fifth rib, and then caused a comminuted fracture of the radius and emerged totally intact. It's just simply not possible. Ballistics tests done with Lee Harvey Oswald's own rifle, which, in which bullets were fired into goats, human cadavers, wrists, and other substances, clearly show that as always happens when bullets strike hard substances, they are flattened, mushroomed. They're not intact as this bullet is. This is a photograph here showing Kennedy's head. The whole post-mortem on Kennedy was done in a very incompetent manner. No experienced professional forensic pathologist was present. Instead, it was all done in secrecy at Bethesda Naval Hospital outside of Washington. Look below Kennedy's Adam's apple in the neck area you see a very large gaping hole that the Warren Commission claims is a bullet hole of exit from the bullet that entered the back of the neck. In fact, when Kennedy was brought into the ER at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Kennedy had a tiny little puncture wound in the front of the throat just below the Adam's apple the wound, according to the Dallas doctors and nurses who treated him, was four by six or three by five millimeters in size. One fifth by one eighth of an inch, in other words. That's a bullet wound of entrance, which they all fought. 
During the emergency resuscitation measures performed on Kennedy, one of the Dallas surgeons did a tracheotomy incision right through that wound. Now, a tracheotomy incision ordin ordinarily is made with a scalpel. It is cut through just wide enough to insert the endotracheal tubes into the breathing apparatus of the body, of course. This looks like a meat grinder went through because by the time the body left Dallas and arrived at the morgue in Bethesda, that tiny little hole with the tiny little trach incision suddenly has become a wide gaping wound that is made to look like a bullet wound of exit when in fact it's not.